Of all the various ways that languages describe and categorize the world, one of the most cross-linguistically prevalent and far-reaching is the concept of animacy. In virtually all languages, there's an unspoken understanding that some nouns are more animate than others, which will influence how any given noun will be treated grammatically, syntactically, or otherwise. What defines a noun as being animate can be difficult to pin down precisely. It's not just a question of whether the noun is alive or not, but it's also strongly correlated with agency, how capable the noun is of taking its own actions, and may also relate to cultural significance, salience, and various other properties. Plus, different languages will draw the lines of what counts as animate in different places. The most straightforward possibility is a simple split between animate and inanimate, but it's very common for languages to distinguish more specific subcategories to form what's called an animacy hierarchy, a spectrum that encompasses every noun in the language. By far the most likely nouns to end up at the top of the animacy hierarchy and to get special treatment over other animate nouns are those that refer to humans. Which isn't too surprising, since humans are naturally quite anthropocentric and are fond of having their languages center around themselves. Also, gods, spirits, or other supernatural beings will usually be grouped into the same category of animacy as humans. The prototypical examples of non-human animate nouns are animals, but some animals, especially large ones that the speakers interact with on a frequent basis, may be considered more animate than small or less notable animals. Sometimes non-living things that are capable of some degree of movement, like running water, weather phenomena, and instruments, tools, or machines, will be treated as more animate than static things like rocks, substances, or places. Also, although plants are alive and can therefore be considered animate in some sense, most languages will lump them in with inanimate nouns. Abstract nouns like emotions, conceptions, and verbal nouns almost always end up at the very lowest rung of the hierarchy. Sometimes pronouns also interact with animacy, in which case the speaker and the listener will virtually always be considered more animate than the third person. This is the archetypal hierarchy that will be largely applicable to most languages, but it's also common for languages to treat culturally important nouns as having higher animacy than might be expected, or to assign animacy based on additional criteria. In Navajo, the highest tier of animacy is occupied by adult humans and lightning. However the language conceptualizes animacy, it's extremely common cross-linguistically for it to factor into various aspects of grammar. One of the most likely things for animacy to influence is the type of grammatical roles a given noun can fill. In a sentence that includes both an animate and an inanimate noun, without any other clues, it's usually safe to assume that the animate noun is doing something to the inanimate noun, since, by their very nature, things of higher animacy are more likely to carry out their own actions. So having extra marking to clarify things may not even be necessary. Many languages organize their role marking systems around this expected relationship. In languages with direct and verse systems, like the Algonquin languages, the marking on the verb will explicitly indicate whether the expected situation of a more animate subject and a less animate object is being upheld, employing a special inverse marker if this expectation has been violated. Many ergative languages accomplish much the same using case marking. In languages like Hittite and Gerbil, whether the arguments of a verb take case marking according to a nominative accusative alignment or an ergative absolutive one will depend on their position in the animacy hierarchy, which helps to emphasize when a noun appears in a role it wouldn't be expected to. There's a strong preference across most languages for having the subjects of verb phrases be animate. In Blackfoot, it's straight up grammatically impossible for an inanimate noun to be a subject. Many languages make use of valency-changing operations to jump the arguments into their preferred positions, like for example using the passive voice to promote an animate noun to subject position even when it's the patient. On the other hand, if an animate noun ends up as a direct object, it may require an extra degree of marking in comparison to an inanimate noun, just to make it especially clear that it's the recipient of the action. In some languages, like Malayalam, only animate nouns take the accusative marker, and Spanish requires that human and some other animate direct objects take the preposition a. Meanwhile, inanimate direct objects will often be left unmarked, since their inherent inability to take any actions of their own means they can be assumed to be the object by default, which is one reason why in many of the Indo-European languages, 
nouns of the neuter gender, most of which derive from Proto-Indo-European inanimate nouns, are marked identically in the nominative and accusative cases. This difference in marking can also occur in other roles beyond the subject and object. In Latin, if an inanimate noun is serving as the agent of a passive construction, it's understood to not really have any agency in the truest sense, and so is treated more like the instrument with which the verb was carried out, simply being placed in the ablative case like a typical instrumental construction. Whereas animate nouns are required to take the preposition ab to mark them as the genuine agent of the passivized verb. A similar thing happens in Kinya Rwanda, where the object of a causativized verb is interpreted as the causee of its animate, but the instrument of its inanimate. Regardless of what grammatical role they're filling, the human preoccupation with animate nouns means that they'll usually be seen as more important or relevant to the conversation, and will therefore have a greater degree of focus put on them, which often involves placing them closer to the beginning of the sentence. This is taken to the extreme in Navajo, where the nouns in a clause must always come in order from most animate to least animate, the grammatical relationship between them being inferred purely through the marking on the verb. In languages with noun incorporation, nouns of lower animacy are generally more likely to be incorporated into the verb, which decreases their salience within the clause while letting the animate nouns fill the roles of core arguments. The greater salience of animate nouns also means that they're likely to take a wider range of inflection than inanimate nouns, most notably when it comes to plural marking. In about a quarter of the world's languages, only animate nouns, especially human nouns, are required to take plural marking, while inanimate nouns are more likely to be treated as mass nouns that aren't marked for number at all. In Mandarin, plural marking is only mandatory on pronouns, but it can also optionally be marked on human nouns while never being marked on non-human nouns. Even if inanimate nouns can be pluralized, it's possible that they'll make use of a different plural strategy than animate ones. In languages with number distinctions beyond singular and plural, nouns of lower animacy tend to distinguish fewer numbers than those of higher animacy, such as how in Hopi, the dual number is usually only reserved for animate nouns. In languages with grammatical gender or noun classes, animacy is likely to be one of the main semantic properties by which the genders are distinguished. Having a binary split between animate and inanimate genders is one of the more common gender systems, even occurring in Proto-Indo-European before the innovation of masculine and feminine genders later on. In languages with more than two genders, some or all of the genders may be associated with particular levels of animacy, or certain genders may be divided into subgenders based on animacy. Just about every language will be sensitive to animacy in at least some contexts, so when making a conlang, it's always worth thinking about where these sorts of distinctions will surface. Specifically, establish the language's animacy hierarchy, which could be as simple as a two-way split between animate and inanimate, or a more complex system with as many as seven or eight different categories. Decide how animacy affects a noun's ability to fill the roles of subjects, objects, and other arguments, and if there are any strategies to ensure that animate and inanimate nouns can fill their preferred roles. Consider how role marking will differ between nouns of different levels of animacy, particularly in the context of differential object marking, ergativity, and direct inverse marking. Determine how animacy interacts with plurality, namely if nouns of lower animacy are able to take the same range of number marking as those of higher animacy. Decide how closely animacy is associated with any grammatical genders or other systems of nominal classification that your language might have. And keep an eye out for any other areas of grammar where animacy might play a part.